Well, then I am going to just uh, wait again. The conversation dies suddenly. You look around to determine the cause and notice that everyone is staring at the disc on the ground. All right, it started the glow is getting brighter every moment. That disc right here that I kind of neglected. I mean, zip now, sorry. <laughs> a fountain of white fire bursts from the disc. It rises into the air, whipping and spitting about. With a flash, the font disappears, replaced by a somewhat confused looking man dressed in a long white form. As he smooths and brushes his garb, you die behind a bush, out of sight. There's no mistaking it, this man is Sartan, and you don't want to scare him away too soon. Welcome, my little friends. It's time for the Ziffnab Show. I hope you're all comfortable. I seem to be without my beautiful assistant. Always liked her outfits, although I couldn't figure out how she kept from catching cold. Well, we'll have to make do without her. I hope you've all been thinking over what we talked about last time. I know you're just dying to philosophize about racial harmony. Yes, I know that the races living in conflict is very tragic. <laughs> That's why we're going to talk about it. No, we want to see some magic. Oh, magic. You want to see magic. Hmm, let's see. Any of you have a $50 bill? No? How about a hundred? Put that coin away, son. This trick only works with the high denominations. <laughs> Hundreds and more. <laughs> hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Where'd the rabbit go to? I could have sworn I had a rabbit in my hat. I... Maybe it was bats in my belfry. You stare open mouthed at the outlandish figure. Without question, this Sipnap is a sergeant, but he is nothing like you envision. He seems harmless enough, perhaps even a little mad, but you know how powerful the sergeant were. Best just to observe, the purpose of this whole act could be to lure any potential enemies into underestimating them. Well, let me try a real showstopper. What was that spell? It always gets everyone's attention. Feather fall? No, something else. Dire fall. Fireball? Fire hole? Wait, it'll come to me. <laughs> Wire ball, dire fall. Ziffnav stands in place, contemplating his spell. The silence lengthens, but the children don't. They turn to each other and talk, obviously used to these lapses. Time passes, and in your crouched position, your leg starts to cramp. Involuntarily, you shift your weight. The movement shakes the bush you use as cover and attracts the sergeant's attention. Is that a new little friend I see back there? Come on up here! Every new friend gets to grab a handful of pennies from the jar. My, you're a tall bugger, aren't you? Wait a moment, you're not a child! In fact, you're not even from Pryan! You're a p p You're a patron! Uh-oh. The white robe Zipnap wears rips around his ears. Before you do a thing, he traces a rune construct into the air. The spell floats into the white disc and appears to catch fire. Charge him, but before you reach the disc, he has disappeared to wherever the spell has taken him. I have learned a spell. I have learned... You 
do, 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 do. Transportation! This spell requires two artifacts called transportation discs. The spell itself does very little, it merely activates the magic already placed within the discs. These discs can instantly transport the caster from the location of the first disc to wherever its twin is located. Uh, before we do that, though, um, the white disc has been embedded in the ground. The surface is smooth and metallic and glows with magic. Uh, can we take it? Oh, well. Let's, uh... Let's go save here. Alright, let's go and, uh... Teleport to, uh... Good old... Anyways, uh, let's go ahead and teleport. You read the spell in the air, it floats slightly over the disc. It strikes, and an explosion of light obscures everything. Eventually, the light fades, but what reappears isn't at all like what was there before. Your surroundings are completely altered. The only thing that remains is the disc, but its colors change to black. The base of a matchless branch, shielded by leaves, is home to a dragon. The branch extends over the chasm between the trees. Hello, dragon. You appear on a wide branch. The somewhat weather-beaten Sartan stands in front of you. Behind him, you notice a gigantic reptile, something you've heard stories alone about, but never seen. Hello, patron. Before you do anything rash, I must inform you that we are both under the watchful eye of my pet dragon. He turns to present a monstrous reptilian form stretched out behind him. Zivnap looks concerned, then kicks the dragon's tail. Wake up, you stupid dragon! I've got a boogie at 12 o'clock! Unfriendly fire! Traitor in our midst! Slowly, the dragon opens its huge eye and regards you. The look it gives you says, I know he's a little excitable, but he's mine. Touch him and you'll answer to me. Then he closes his eyes and starts from Whenever I really need him, does he help out? No, he sleeps! It's enough to make someone go out and get a cat! Well, <laughs> since you're already in my home, I might as well be hospitable. Coffee, tea, a push off of the branch? Oh, we are gonna go through every dialogue with him. Uh, like I said, he is my favorite. Of course, I really loved him in the Dragonlance books, but anyways. Who are you? I'm Cortex, the thinking machine! No, wait a second, that's not it. I knew a moment ago. Ooh, that's right! I'm James Bond, Agent 007. I've got a license to kill, so you'd better keep your distance. Somewhere I have a lighter that can obliterate half a continent! Either that or take your picture. What? Something wrong with you? I told you! I'm Bond! James Bond! I don't think this boy's playing with a full deck. No, you're not. You're Ziffnab, the children told me. Ha <laughs> ha! That's just my cover! You a fool, huh? Can't blame you. I'm the best in the business. Quit fooling around. I know you're Ziffnab. Although what kind of name Ziffnab is, I'm not sure. Oh yeah? Well, what kind of name is Haplo? He's wildly that one. How'd you know my name is Haplo? Your name is Haplo? Glad to meet ya! I'm Ziffnab. This is kind of where I feel like this is your 18 intelligence negative whiz kind of wizard maybe <laughs> oh gosh anyways you didn't answer my question how'd you know my name is haplo why you just told me when you introduced yourself you would better start paying attention to the conversation if you're gonna learn anything Try to keep it together, Sartan. I need some information. Well, let's see. I have a piece of microfilm lodged in my inner ear from my smuggling days, but I can't really talk about that. How about the weather? Pretty sunny, huh? Actually, talking about the weather isn't quite as interesting when it's always the same. 
Yeah, Brian is always sunny, that is true. Why are you talking to the children about racial harmony? The races have never been closer to tolerating each other, especially the children. If I can impress upon them the importance of peace, they may achieve unification. You've referred to the unification. What exactly is it? The unification? That's the racial harmony I've been talking about. When all the races come together and are capable of living with each other, the world are key to open their resources to the mensch, wake up the sleeping Sartan, and ready the realm for the interconnection. Each world set up its own test to determine when the unification occurred, when the Mensch figured out the way into the Citadel, when they worked together to enter it, they will have unified. This was supposed to happen in every realm. After all of them were ready, the Council was supposed to complete the Sundering by interconnecting the realms. The new society would begin, but it's been so long, far too long. Something went wrong. What do you think went wrong with the plan? We took on too much ourselves. We were gods, and we were infallible. I warned Sama that we should wait. There were alternatives, but he didn't listen. He was full of his dream. Some masters off in space. Lost. Rolled of his own. What is this dragon? He's my pet dragon. I met him shortly after I came to Priyan. He took a liking to me, so I decided to adopt him. He told me that he embodies good in the wave. Doesn't make any sense to me. If he's supposed to be the personification of good, then he wouldn't be so lazy. That dragon is the embodiment of good? I know. Hard to believe, isn't it? Especially since he didn't just eat you up as soon as you arrived. But he's a colored dragon. Metal dragons are good. Everyone knows this. Come on. Are you implying that I'm evil? Of course not. Are you inferring that you are evil? That may be important. We might be on the verge of a breakthrough. A few more sessions and we'll be able to make some serious progress on your complex. What's the wave? You know, it's when a portion of the audience lifts their arms, followed by another portion, then another until it completes a full circle around the stadium. No, wait, that's different. The wave is a little harder to explain. Reality is balanced. Good and evil can never be more powerful than each other. When that happens, the wave compensates. The dragon was created a long time ago in response to something else. Something very evil. Do you know what the evil thing was? Is, my good man, is. Since my dragon here is still around, you must assume that his evil counterpart is still around as well. I have my theories as to its form, but it's such a depressing subject that I prefer not to talk about it. An evil dragon. What if it's a gold dragon? And we're just mixed up because, again, Sargents are the bad guys, remember. They were the ones who destroyed the worlds in the first place. We're trying to put it back together. Anyways. Enough. Let's talk about something else. All right. How about those Steelers? Think they'll go all the way? Not this season. Where are the other Sartan? I don't know. Have you seen them? I figured they'd been hiding from me all this time. Some joke. I turn my back for a couple years, take a little moonlight stroll, and they all go away. Well, it's not funny! Where do you think they could be hiding? Well, I left them in the Citadel when I went for a walk. I assumed that they'd be along, but they never came. I haven't seen them since. I found a group of them on Arianus. They were in crystal coffins. Of course they were. The unification has yet to take place on Arianus. When it does, the coffins will open and the Sartan will come out to help the Mench. No, you don't understand. I did something there and the coffins opened. All of the Sartan were dead. They're dead? All dead? How did it happen? How could it happen? You did this, patron, didn't you? Somehow your race has struck back and killed us! Admit it! Well... We... If, if he didn't have his dragon right next to him, we, we might go this route. But, uh, yeah...
You're wrong, Ziphnab. One of my missions is to find out where the Sartan disappeared to. If the Sartan are dying off, it's not of my doing. Ah, of course. Your people were imprisoned when this happened. You couldn't have had anything to do with it. There's something else out there. Why are you here? I don't know why I'm here exactly. Even though our policy is non-interference when it comes to the unification, I felt I had to help it along. It's been so long and the Mensch have never been so close as they are now. How long have you been here, alone? I'm not alone. I've got my dragon, I've got the children. I don't need more than that. But it seems like a long time since I've seen any of my people. A long time. Let's talk about something else. You're obviously uncomfortable with this subject. Suit yourself. Where is Prion's seal piece? Ah, the seal piece. Your lord needs it, huh? You know, there are better uses for it than what he intends. What do you know about my lord? Oh, nothing. I'm sure he's a wonderful fella. Life of the party kind of guy. Am I right? I'll bet he could show me a card trick or two. How do you know what my lord intends? What do patron lords usually intend after they've escaped from thousands of years of imprisonment? You think maybe he wants to conquer the realms, reform the world to enslave the masses? No, nobody's that antisocial. What uses? Interested? Well, back in the old days, we had plans for those pieces. Big plans. Plans that make other plans look really small. Really huge, huge plans. And important, woo-wee! You don't get any more important than those plans. That's how we made plans in the old days. Big and important. Okay. Well, what were your plans? What plans? Don't try and throw me off track. Where is it? All right, don't get in a huff. Where did we put that piece? Didn't we build something to put it in? Oh! That's right, it's in the Citadel! How do I get in? That's a toughie. No one can get in. In fact, it was designed to keep everyone out. I certainly don't think any exceptions were made for angry patrons. Of course, after the unification, anyone could just walk right through the front door. You mean I'll have to make all of the races get along before I can get that door open? Well, it's not quite that difficult. We set up a test to detect when the races started to get along. We gave each a symbol. A golden sword to the humans, a golden staff to the elves, and a golden hammer to the dwarves. If a representative from each race places their symbol upon the door to the citadel at the same time, it will open. The three races must do it together. One man with all the symbols wouldn't be able to open the door. Hey, hey, hey don't cheat like you did on Arianus. <laughs> Where are all of those symbols? They certainly didn't take quite the care of them that we hoped they would. Only the humans still revere their symbol, but they look on it as a symbol of leadership instead of its actual meaning. The humans role in a new integrated society. Every human leader carries it. It gives them the authority to rule. I believe the current holder is the young princess who occasionally comes to my gatherings. The elves threw their staff into a local pit called the Maw. It's been lost for generations. I don't know how the unification can occur until it is recovered. The dwarves, straight-lined practical thinkers that they are, took one look at the hammer, decided that it was the most inferior hammer they'd ever seen, and stuck it deep in their weapons vault. I don't think they even remember that they have it. Isn't there any other way to get in the Citadel? Well, let's see. A spell might help you out. Maybe if you blew down a wall or something. There's one spell I remember. Uh, what was it? Uh, tie a wall, lie a stall? I can't seem to recall. Oh, well. Sorry I couldn't help. Didn't you come from there? How'd you get out? Getting out is not the same thing as getting in. In fact, they're two entirely different things. Yin and yang, night and day, black hat and white hat. With that, Zipnap removes his hat, squints at it, and downs on it until it looks worse than ever. Satisfied, he places it on his head and smiles. Tell me more about the Citadel itself. All right. 
All right, that's a start. What's the citadel? <laughs> that's a pretty open-ended question. The citadel is a fortress, or it's a city, or it's a power station. Take your pick. Where is the citadel? Oh, it's that way, I think. You should be able to see it from the air in your flying ship. It's really big. Had to be, you know. How is the Citadel a fortress? At present, that seems to be the only task that it accomplishes on a regular basis. All of its other functions were intended to come online following the unification. Right now, the Citadel lies dormant. The Titans roam the forest. Everything waits on the unification. That's why I'm trying so hard to convince the children to throw away their prejudices. Titans? What are they? The Titans are magical creatures created to operate the Citadel. We built them to last two big suckers, maybe three times your height, and powerful enough to rip up a small tree. <laughs> Their appearance is a little unsettling. They don't have any eyes. Don't need them. We gave them enough magic to sense everything around them. In fact, they can sense things miles away when they're motivated enough. When we built this realm, we dumped them into the forest. Until the Citadel powered up, they had nothing to do. I think they went a little crazy. <laughs> they knew they were supposed to serve the Sartan, and they knew that the Citadel was important, but that's about it. Titans aren't the smartest creatures. Somehow they found a Sartan relic. I think it was a crystal sculpture of some sort. Without purpose in their lives, they fixated on it. To them, I suppose it had religious significance, and to this day, they worship it. Against all of our expectations, the Mench actually encountered the Titans. Dwarves moved into the area surrounding the Titans' forest. They understandably wandered in. The Titans reacted by defending their relic, and they drove the Dwarves off, dragging their wounded behind them. But dwarves are stubborn creatures, and they continue to live just outside of the forest. As long as they stay outside, the titans leave them alone. The two races live in uneasy peace. The titans notice nothing besides their artifact, and the dwarves leave it alone. Those dwarves are understandably nervous, living so close to their enemy, so they keep a stock of weapons handy. I don't think they've actually pulled them out for years, but having them available makes them feel more secure. Sounds familiar. What exactly is the Titan's purpose? Why'd you make them? The Citadel is a big place. It needed a lot of workers to keep it running smoothly. Instead of enslaving the Mench or working the Citadel ourselves, we tailor-made a race to do it for us. We also designed them to protect the Citadel, and ironically, the Mench as well. Somehow, they've perverted this defensive behavior to focus on the crystal artifact to the exclusion of everything else. Of course, their unnatural interest in this piece of Sartan refuse should disappear when the Citadel is open. The unification will trigger the imprinted behavior that will summon the Titans into the Citadel. They should start it operating and they'll forget about everything in their previous lives. What's the Titans' magic sense like? The Titans had to be given the power to sense the position of objects, even though the objects might be out of sight. This was principally for the operation and repair of the Citadel after it started working. Because they were equipped with this sense, we decided not to give them eyes. They see better than you or I, and they track better than any scout since they already know the location of something even when they're away from it. How is the Citadel a city? We intended the Citadel to house everyone, the humans, the elves, and the dwarves, all together. Naturally, this couldn't happen until they learned to live peacefully among each other. So it's all's wait, empty and dead, for the unification. How is the Citadel a power station? Brian has a role in the whole. Following the interconnection, Brian was to supply power to the other realms. Its four suns produce more than enough energy for itself and the other world. The Citadel was supposed to control the flow of energy from the suns through the Death Gate into the other worlds. How about we talk about something else? Suit yourself. Uh, you know what? Let's go. Where'd you get these transporter discs? They're just something I picked up. Rather handy, don't you think? 
I had to plant the white one in the ground to keep the children from wandering off with it. I wouldn't want to appear in the middle of the campfire. <laughs> if I didn't have them, I'd have to rely on my pet dragon to take me everywhere, and getting him out of bed could blow a whole day. As far as I know, there's no other way back to the nearest tree. Give me one good reason why I shouldn't blow you away. If you so much as look at me wrong, my dragon will find out what you're made of and decorate the tree with it. As he smiles, leans against the gnawing system branch, and falls on his face. That's a good way to end this. I have had enough. Goodbye, Sartan. Well, I can't say I'm sorry to see you go, Haplo. But take care. You have many trials ahead of you. The fate of the world rests on your shoulders. Thanks, Fizzfan. Oh, with that, let's, uh... What's the other one that he said? Dang it. Ow. Oh, anyways, we'll just say that. <laughs> I know that's not right. Alright, uh, hello. Unthreaten the dragon in turn regards you non threateningly. No restful, half lighted eyes. His entire demeanor suggests that he has nothing to fear from the tiny patron visiting his home. His beautiful iridescent scales glisten with the dappled sunlight, and when he stretches, display rainbows everywhere. What's up? The dragon isn't very talkative. Zip now communicates enough for both of them. Well, this is the perfect time to see how our magic fares against them. You cast a spell the dragon, but it seems to shrug it off. Perhaps it's impervious to your magic. Yeah, that's basically the thing. Though. So, let's say swap it. I wouldn't trade places with you for anything. Oh, you reach out to the sergeant, casting spell at the same time. Oh well, he knows what the swap spell is. You're sure making things hot for me, aren't you, patron? I'd return the favor if I could only remember the right spell. What was it? Higher more? Acquire all? Oh, someday. Uh, someday. All right, well, maybe you'll feel better with some coal. Now here I am trying to give you a warm reception and you're trying to cool me off. I should be doing that to you, you hot-headed patron. Alright, uh, so I think we can actually take this. You're welcome to take that disc. I can always get my dragon to ferry me back and forth, but unless I miss my guess, you don't have a pet dragon. Without the disc, you're going to have to find another way back to the other tree. That's fine. I got... Indiana Jones time. 